Okay, hello, I'm Natalie Johnson. I'm a first year PhD student at the University of Newcastle. I've been a crystallographer since October, so I'm definitely a new user. And I'm going to be speaking to you today about a topic of the utmost importance to our community, and that is X-ray origins, protection or paranoia, or to be more specific, how can we ensure the genuineness of diffraction data? And this is something, instead of what we can get out of metadata, maybe it's something we should consider putting in. So the origin of diffraction data becomes an issue if we start saying that the deposition of raw diffraction data is a method to prevent fraud. And this is only a good method if it's sufficiently difficult to produce raw diffraction data. And as Lois said, it is definitely more difficult to produce raw diffraction data than a, modified, a fake modified structure factor file. But what I intend to demonstrate today is that it's still a simple procedure and we can, we can make raw diffraction frames quite easily. So this is a, something we've discovered as part of uh, in investigations into the, we're looking to improve data processing methodologies. We've been trying to find out the data quality requirements for a good charge density refinement. And to do this, we required some software that would allow us to replicate diffraction data, but whilst varying certain things, such as um, the form of the, this, uh, this, the form of the, things in the background. Did you say that? Did you say that? And um, so when we were doing this, we figured out that the software that we produced, we could modify very simply, and that would create structure, raw diffraction data for an entirely fake molecule. So my talk's going to be in two parts. And the first part is going to be how easy it is to create fake raw diffraction data. We're going to go through an example of a molecule we've created with fake raw diffraction data to back it up. And then we'll talk about how the method that we use is done. And then secondly, we're going to go through some suggestions of a method to ensure that diffraction frames can be proved that they're genuine. And these are just a few suggestions, nothing that we've tested the feasibility of, but just ideas as to things we could consider to make sure that things are genuine. And crystallography is currently the gold standard of analytical techniques, but we need to remain vigilant to the potential avenues of fraud and where that can creep in. So fraud is not just a problem in crystallography, it's a problem in all of science. There's many bad things to come of fraudulent data, not just the money that's spent to investigate such cases, but the time wasted trying to repeat results, avenues of research that are pursued where there's no gain to be had because all the data is faked. And um, no paper has been, no journal has been safe from this. These are just some retraction from Jacks, science and nature. And these, were, these papers all had to be retracted because they were based on data which had been faked. And with our, within our own science, we've had a number of cases in the past 10 years where structure solutions have been submitted to papers and they've been based on fraudulent data. One case in particular, this was discovered during the testing of Chexif. So they found out that all the structure factor files for a certain set of compounds were very similar, actually they were identical. And what it turned out is what happened was that they'd done one set of diffraction experiments and then they'd used the structure solution and the structure factor files and then they'd made sets of solutions by modifying atoms inside the unit cell and then manually editing the unit cell. Thankfully, this was found, but what if we had raw data? This is a cell phone email. This is just the ill that we use to calibrate our diffractometer. So we put, got some data from it, and we got a decent R factor. And it checks if report with one error in, but when we cut off the data at 0.83 angstroms, which I've been assured is a conventional limit, got completely no alerts at all. So, but let's just imagine that what we wanted was not the sulfur, sulfur yield, we wanted the selenium yield. We've been trying for weeks and weeks to get this structure. We just needed one more structure to get before our paper's finished. And we know it's pretty much similar to the sulfonium yield, but we just can't get it. So what we could do is we could modify 
the element can change its surface to the palladium, and we need to move the bond lengths to make sure that everything is normal and that could be our nice new structure. But let's make it a little bit more interesting. We could delete some atoms from the five membered ring, we could change some atoms up in the six membered ring. Just doing that now. And then we'll be left with a completely well, a different molecule. So I'm just adding in some extra hydrogens, and this is what we get. So if we keep the if we fix the atom positions and then we do a refinement, as you can see, it's a terrible R factor, 38%. And it checks if report, which is none too impressed. There's many, many alerts saying that this is not the right structure. And so presumably all hope is lost. We're never going to get that Cellini Millard. But we, can, but we have got a modification to our code that can create such data. And then this can be indexed. It can be integrated and scaled as normal. We can find the structure. And we end up with this, an R1 of... An R1 of 1% and it checks if report that when again is cut off at 0.83 angstroms, there's a nine metal reflection so level C. So this is this is pretty much frightening stuff, I feel. And how we how we've managed to do it is there are other software out there that can produce diffraction fire, diffraction frames. And when we were creating our piece of software, we were worried we were going to have to do all the calculations of where the reflections are going to be. But we remember the .raw file. And the .raw file is a file that's spit out in certain softwares during the integration process. And it contains information about every reflection. You can't really see that there, but it's got the diffraction cosines, any corrections that have been added to the file. And most importantly for us, it has integrated intensity, and the x, y, z coordinate of the spot. So we already know where everything's going to be. So the modification to this code comes in when we replace the integrated intensity with the f squared values from the calculated structure factor files of the uh, entirely fake molecule. So once we, we know where everything is, we need to, and we've got the total intensity of what the new spot's going to be, we need to spread it out across the frames. So we just model the profile of the spread of the intensity through, through the frames as just a Gaussian. And then to get the total intensity of the entire spot of what's going to be on one frame, we take the cumulative distribution between that frame and the frame before. And all of that percentage of the, the total intensity is going to be the total intensity of that reflection on that frame. And then once we've found out all the stuff for all the reflections and spread it out how much is going to be on each frame, we need to make the images themselves. And we do this by just having an image matrix. And each element of the matrix is going to be what would correspond to an intensity value from the detector. So if we're going to calculate the what, what percentage of the reflection on the frame would be on that pixel, the one in blue, with a reflection centroid in the little red dot there. We're just going to do two 1D calculations for simplicity. We're first going to calculate the percentage of the intensity on, a, on the row that it's on. Just the same method using the cumulative distribution. And then we're going to do the similar thing of the percentage of the intensity on that pixel. And then we do that for every reflection that's going to be on that frame. And then we need to add a background. So our model is very, very simple. We just pick up, we just get the computer to calculate a random number between 0 and 5, and then add that on, add a, a different random number onto every pixel. And then we've got a frame header. We're using .sfrm. So because we've got the original data from the real, the real run, we can use most of the data from the frame header. We've got all the angles are going to stay the same. We just need to make a few edits as to like how much the total intensity count is going to be. We just change a few things. And then we need to um, encode the image format. But as you said before, all these image format files are very well documented. So we know exactly what's going to be in. And we know exactly what kind of format we need 
the image matrix to be in. And this is a comparison of some frames. This is the real data and the replica over there. And you might be able to see that the real data has slightly more, the background's a bit more noisy. Obviously, in the replica data, the spots are a lot more perfect. And you might be able to see that the spots seem to remain on the replicated data for a little bit longer than they do in the real. And that's because we don't take into account the kind of what would be the Lorentz correction of how long the spots are going to be, depending on what position they're on. So we should really be asking ourselves, is it any point in depositing raw diffraction data if we can't prove that it's genuine? And just creating a new model molecule isn't the only thing we could do. If we've got really noisy data that's getting a terrible R1, we could use that code to just recreate the data and then get get a better refinement, you could do, you could invent an entirely new polymorph by doing some calculations to find a new energy minimum and then moving things around in the unit cell. One thing about our method is that because we're, we're basing it on an original piece of data, that the unit cell is going to be the same size for both of these things. But if you're doing it on a data set that hasn't been included in the CCDC, than, than who's to know. So there's a few things of how we could detect fraud within raw diffraction frames. And most extreme, we could encrypt the entire frame. So the fraudsters would have to know either what was inside the frame or they'd have to be able to encrypt it completely. But of course, it's going to come with some downside. It's going to slow down any kind of software to process it because every single frame has to be decrypted. And then it could also hamper the detection of current and new diffraction frame formats. Because if nobody's allowed to know what's in, what goes on inside it, then we can't get anything out. And it's going to hamper any kind of metadata things if people can't get inside the frames in the first place. So perhaps something, some kind of encryption within the frame header. Um, We could just take a bit of information and then have an encryption inside the header, and that could be checked when the raw files were submitted for deposition. So perhaps, obviously, it's got to be to do with the image, because if we're just saying, oh, we'll just encrypt the date, then it's relatively easy to just take original files and then replace the image inside them with a, with a new image. And so we could take some maybe some values of the intensity of the pixels within the image and we could get those numbers out and then we could encrypt those and those could be checked. But again, if anybody knows or how, how well known this is, they could just keep these pixels the same when they recreate the data from any original data. So we could maybe add some information. In the art world, fraud is prevented by, they take a, well, they try to prevent it by taking a photograph of the picture without its frame. So any kind of information around the outside of the frame will only be known to people who have access to the catalog. So we can maybe do a similar thing, because obviously in, in a gallery, you're only going to see it in its lovely picture frame. Yes, so we could add something around the outside, or maybe within the image itself, that people would have to know that it was there. And this, this information could all be checked when the thing was deposited. But again, if it's the same in every case, if force is not of existence, it's very easy to get, well, it's easier to get around it. So perhaps some form of certification. So an additional file can be processed during the diffraction frame process. And then we could either certify each image itself, or we could certify the entire run, so the diffractor might could produce some encrypted information about the frames, and those could be produced in a little, a little file, and we required that file as well as the raw diffraction frames to prove that everything was real. So I think I've steamed through that, and I've come to the end of my talk. Um, I'd just like to acknowledge some people. I'd like to acknowledge Jennifer's bursaries from the BCA, the RSC, and the IUCR that have allowed me to come here today. My supervisor for giving me a really interesting topic to work on. The rest of my research group, who've helped me in preparing for this talk. 
And I'd like to thank you all for listening. I'd like to thank the organizers that, that invited me to come. And I'd like to leave you with two questions. Um, should we rely on the honesty of our peers? And maybe more worryingly, has anything like this already been done? Have you got any easier questions for us? <laughs> So yeah, there's been a lot of discussion of this same issue in the macromolecular community. Um, I'd say that the conclusion is um, a sophisticated and dedicated person who wants to commit fraud, you cannot stop them. Um, I actually like your last idea the very best. Um, uh, because if a equipment manufacturer um, puts, puts the stamp, uh, does a hash of, of the um, images and puts a stamp on it, it, you have to go way back in. It's a really a lot of work to, to, to commit fraud at that level. And it seems very easy, um, and so it seems like something that it could well be done. And so I see no reason, no impediment to doing that particular one. Yeah. So I, but I think the point is that it is really easy to do. I'm only a first year PhD student. I've got minimal knowledge of crystallography, and I managed to do all this with 500 lines of Python code. So it's, it's a lot more simple than no, actually, uh, I disagree with that. So I think we could detect your, your fraud very, oh, yeah. very but, quickly. And to, to make fraud that's not detectable is, is actually very, very difficult. It requi basically requires sampling something that no one has ever seen. And there's, and there's kind of no way around that particular aspect of it. So, so a, a sophisticated fraud requires a lot of work and a lot of dedication. Something has to really want, want to do it, I believe. You know, okay, well, maybe this is just so there's, a, there's a, a problem there. This is really easy to spot because it's based on a unit cell which is known, okay? But if you, the number of samples that we have in the lab that are unpublished that have unit cells that aren't known, you can use exactly the same process. Now, the, in this case, it is actually easy to spot because the background is very uniform, but it's very easy to make one that's not. The reason we haven't is because we weren't setting out to do this. It's just a byproduct of some other code. I think that fraud is really infrequent. Yes, it happens. And it hurts us a lot. And I do not, I do not know how much we should fight with that. I mean, we should fight up, a posteriori, not, a, <laughs> yes, I mean, after the fact, after the crime. It's, it's difficult. And I, but you see that I see the set of accessible set of experimental data as a way to find how to do experiment better. And also, uh, people are making mistakes. We are all making mistakes. Yes. I see when I see some of my data, which I have done 10 years ago or 15 years ago. I was very naive or very stupid or whatever. Yes, and we all have this problem. And it's not, I do not see that as a way to, to uh, show that we can do things better, because we can. We now can do things better, and in the future, Others will do things better than we are, and we all have to learn on mistakes. And obviously, it's better to learn on somebody's mistake than on our own mistake. Yes, and this is what Bismarck said, that I was better than others because I always were trying to learn on other people's mistakes. Yes, it's not, I, I, I'm not as smart, I'm learning on my mistakes. So if I may be allowed the, the, the chairman's privilege. So th there's a point of philosophy here, I think, which is um, the uh, uh, process of science, the popper um, hypothesis driven and the process of, of induction deduction from large data sets, which you might call a Darwinian approach. So at its heart, 
you had the wish to make a, um, a compound in the structure which completed a, a series. So it, it, it was a beautiful fit to your wishes. And it was therefore a bit like the Henrik Schoen um, uh, nanomaterials uh, fraud. So I think it tells us something about what, what is publishable and what is interesting. Um, so, um, you know, if, if it's that last uh, piece of jigsaw which makes the perfect fit, maybe we need a test which, which assesses that. Um, anyway, I said there was an even more difficult observation to make. Um, but, I mean, at the moment, we don't require any raw data to back up any structure files that we're, that we're submitting, right? So... But it is true that and I'm one of the people who, who was saying, yes, the raw data will make it difficult. And thank you for finding fault with that simple observation, which <laughs> is, is important. No, that's very good. <laughs> I think we have to move on, unless you can say in a very short moment, Simon. Uh, Simon Cole, Southampton. I think everyone gets a bit um, misled by the fraud uh, argument. Um, but you've made a very, very good point, and what I think we should be considering is that it's extremely important that you can assert that this particular person did this particular experiment at this point in time on this instrument. There are ways we can do that, and I think the certification route, uh, perhaps supplemented with some other things, um, is the way to do it. Fraud or no fraud. Yep. We should thank Natalie, and that was her first talk she confided uh, in me before she came up, and I thought you did splendidly. Well done. Thank you very much, and it was a great contribution. <laughs>